Tozer, renewed, day by day. I know I am. <laughs> When we choose to accept that God is in control, it changes the way we deal with life and everyday aspects of it. That if your God is real, then you know you can talk to him and he can talk to you. Then you know that you have an assurance. Then you know quite a few things, actually, but you know that there's a existence beyond what you can see or understand and that you talk to God and he shares with you what's on his heart and mind and what he wants you to do. If you don't have a living God, then you are subject to regulations, rules, religion, and all these aspects that they do frame your mind and they do help you in some ways to become a better person, but the reality is, is that they don't get you to the place that you want to be, which is to know God. And knowing God isn't something like, oh, well, God is everywhere and he's, you know, Allah and he's Buddha and he's, you know, Tao and he's, you know, the Gandhis and he's the this and he's the that and he's in this and he's in that and he is there and he went there. No, the reality is one person said, I am revealing to you your heavenly father, the Lord God Almighty who created heaven and earth. I am Jesus. I and my Father are one. From that moment on, every other religion in the world falls short of that reality of a relationship that Jesus had with his Father that he said he could give to us if we were born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. You must be born again. You don't have an option. If you want to have religion, don't call yourself a Christian. But if you want to have a relationship with God, then seek Him to know Him in a more personal and intimate way so that you have not a religion of Christianity, but a relationship of Jesus Christ and Him working in you both to do and to will the Father's good pleasure. God does not have to be persuaded to bless us. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Matthew 5, 6. The problem of the spiritual life is not to persuade God to fill us, but to want God sufficiently to permit him to do so. We have to want God first. Jesus himself spoke of our hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Hunger and thirst are physical sensations which in their most Severe stages may become real pain. You have to really want it. It has been the experience of countless seekers after God that when their desires became a pain, they were suddenly and wonderfully filled with God. You have to want in order to get, and you have to really want in order to really get. Seems simple. Occasionally there appears on the religious scene a person whose unsatisfied spiritual longings become so big and important in the life that they crowd out every other interest. Such a man or woman refuses to be content with the safe, the conventional prayers of the frostbound brethren called upon to lead in prayer week after week in local assemblies is not content with religion and chooses to seek after God himself for himself. His or her yearnings carry him away and often make something of a nuisance out of him. People don't understand them. His puzzled fellow Christians shake their heads and look knowingly at each other, but like the blind man who cried out after his sight and was rebuked by the disciples, he cries the more a great deal. People when you're seeking God will give you every excuse in the world why you can't hear God speak audibly. And yet, the one answer they can't say to you is what Jesus said himself. My sheep hear my voice. It doesn't mean read my voice. It means hear my voice. You have to seek and want after God that bad. As all the saints throughout history have said the same. And if he has not yet met the conditions or there is something hindering the answer to his prayers, he may pray on into the late hours. 
Not the hour of night, but the state of his heart decides the time of his visitation. It is easy to learn the doctrine of personal revival and victorious leaving, living. It is quite another thing to take our cross and plod on the dark and bitter hill of self-renunciation. Here many are called, but few are chosen. God reveals himself as he decides. You know, I hear people all the time tell me, Oh, I really do want God to speak to me. Do you? I've asked that question to people thousands of times. Do you really want to know? Because the truth is not, it's not going to be pleasant. It's not going to be, you know, God is going to bless you out of your mind because, you know, you get to know God. In reality, once you know God, you're going to find yourself challenged beyond anything you've ever experienced before because you are dealing with a holy and just God. And if he chooses to speak to you, if he chooses to direct you, if he chooses to reveal himself as a real living God, then you understand what fear of the Lord means. And it's not terror. It's not running away from him. It's awe-inspiring and awe-reverence that you recognize holiness is something you don't have at all. You don't. And God can make you holy as the censer was taken by the angel to John and touched his lips. God can make you holy, but he won't do it now because you live in an unholy world. He will do it when you're in his presence. And he has made you holy in Jesus himself living in you. But in order to hear God speak, in order to know him, in order to see him and his hand operating in the circumstances in every single minutiae of your life, you got to want it. You got to really, really want it. You got to ache for it. You got to burden yourself with it. You got to choose to go after it with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and nothing will be content or laid still until you have God himself. And when you do that, at the time that God chooses, if he chooses you to hear him, you'll be blessed. But it will also change your life and require of you a sacrifice. And you will have a cross and you will bear your cross. We're told it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God with good reason. I don't give any stock to those that fly off to heaven and have this wonderful experience and they come back with glorious stories of what they saw with their loved ones. I don't take any stock of those stories that say they went to hell, you know, and what a terrible experience it was and how you should never want it. Those are all nice that could be revealed in a way that God chooses to have that person's faith increased by what they experienced. But there's only one person I know that was there, Jesus. There's only one person I know that had been to hell, Jesus. There's only one person I put my stock and trade in and everything that I've experienced when I want an explanation of what's happened, Jesus. The point being is that it's nice to have experiences, but except you have the reality of God in your life, you'll never know whether the experience is dictating your faith or the reality of God is. And when Jesus is speaking to you, you have no doubt. When God is speaking to you, there is no question. When people are using the Holy Spirit for their own means, it may be because God is teaching them through the Holy Spirit something that may be only for them and not necessarily for you. So be careful and be mindful that if you are seeking to follow God and find to where he will speak to you, that you are choosing him alone and nothing else will satisfy you. Because the psalmist said, when I awake in thy likeness, then I will be satisfied. For me, it wasn't enough that God spoke to me. And he did audibly. And I walked away. But it was enough that he loved me. And he brought me to this day where I could share all that God would say. And when you encounter that kind of love, that kind of grace, that kind of mercy, that kind of forgiveness, you <laughs> will be the debtor to all men. But more than that, 
you will be a living example of God's love to humanity because you can share more than anyone else. God is love. Oh yeah, God is love.